If you have a Bible today, would you turn with me to James chapter 5, please? James chapter 5, as we continue to talk about pure religion, the Bible speaks of pure and undefiled religion. It's not talking about man-made rituals or repetitive observances. It's first and foremost talking to those who have come by faith to believe in Jesus as Lord, as Savior of their soul. I wonder if you've come to Jesus today. You can be very religious and not know the Savior, meaning we can observe different religious garb, but have no eternal life, have no redemption, making us a new creation. The Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, saved from the wrath of God and the judgment to come, saved from your old life, your regret, your shame, your past, your mistakes, all those things that haunt a person. The Bible says Jesus came to save us from our sins. And that he can transform your mind. He can renew your heart. He can give peace to your soul. And the Bible says those that have truly believed in him, they walk in a certain life of fruitful worship known as pure and undefiled religion. Pure religion restores a person. It restores us from a wayward path. It restores us from a tumultuous life. It restores us even from sickness of the soul and of the body. Look what James has to say about it. Verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. She must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Be thankful that you're in a season of cheerfulness in your life. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. The Lord restores those that belong to him in a variety of ways. Once we come to know the Lord, there are seasons of our life where we can at times stray, meaning we run wayward. It does not mean that we have lost our salvation or we are without the grace of God or we are no longer under his mercy. But the Lord allows us the freedom to run into our own rebellion and to create storms and difficulty for ourselves. And many have done that. I have done that. And he has a different, several different ways by which he will draw us back by way of restoration. One of them is through discipline, the Bible says. God's divine hand of correction toward us when we need it. The Bible says in Hebrews, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. It says, do not reject the discipline of the Lord. Many have. I have. God is disrupting your path. God is causing perhaps a storm upon your life in an effort to draw you back to the place of righteousness. David prayed to the Lord, lead me in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And sometimes we, we despise, we reject the discipline of the Lord. We continue to say no and callous our heart and our soul against it. We say, I know better. I've got a handle on things. I'm going to make it. This isn't what people say it is. It's not what you think it is. The Bible says of the Lord's discipline is correction. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful. It's not. It's not great in the moment. It says, but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields, it brings about the peaceful fruit of righteousness. The Bible says again in Hebrews, the Lord disciplines us for our good, for our good to turn our heart back again. 
that peaceful fruit of righteousness. All discipline for the moment, it's not great. I've been through it. Somebody might be going through it today. You might be sitting here, but it doesn't mean that uh, we are walking at peace with the Lord and his word. Somebody could be here today in rebellion against God. Maybe some teenager came because, you know, your parents said, if we're going to pay for your car insurance, you got to come to church on Sunday. And God bless you, parents. Pull those levers a little bit. Twist it just a little. Now, I don't know. You know, there could be a husband or a wife or just somebody that came in today, but you haven't really come to the place of turning from the sin in your life. Sometimes people try to put one foot in the church in holiness and righteousness and one foot in the world. Depends on what day it is and who they're around. The Bible says the Lord disciplines us for our good. And it's not great. He sends in the Bible storms to our life sometimes. The storm of Jonah says the Lord hurled a storm upon Jonah when he was in rebellion on that boat headed in the wrong direction. Somebody's storm today might have been sent by the Lord and you blame the devil for it. People are like, man, Satan's just after me. You're after yourself. He doesn't need to do any work. Some people are out there trying to put the devil out of a job. Doing a fine enough job yourself. And it's God who sends the storm to turn your heart back again. The Bible says there are times the Lord sent thunder to shake people. Drought and pestilence onto the land that they would... Repent of their idolatry, their pride, their belief that everything great in my life, all of this fruit, all of this blessing is from my, people become a God unto themselves. It's from my hand and my know-how and my education and my favor. And so the Lord will send a drought and a pestilence upon them to remind them who they are not and who he is and turn their heart back again. He sent wild animals in among the people. They would cry out to God for help. Foreign armies putting them to flight. You know, we got to thank God sometimes for his discipline and his correction that brings about the peaceful fruit of righteousness in our life. Peaceful fruit of righteousness. Somebody today, your life might consist of anything but peace. And there is no fruit of righteousness. It is the fruit of rejection and rebellion of God. There are storms sometimes we look back on our life and we didn't like it, but we look back and we're like, man, God, thank you for that season. Thank you for loving me enough to correct me enough to bring me back before I destroyed myself completely. It's hard, but sometimes you gotta thank God for that bankruptcy. That was the storm. That was the, the lion he sent upon your life to cause us to wake up. That tornado siren, wake up to the storm that you have caused yourself. Sometimes you gotta look back and thank God when you got fired. In the moment, you're like, where is God? And that's what God was doing to turn your heart, to gain your attention. Some of us in here, you know, you've been arrested. You've been through the court system and maybe done some jail time or whatever it might be. Miserable, miserable season. You look back and you're like, thank God. It was in that jail cell that I had nowhere to look but to God's grace. I had nothing to do but repent of what brought me here in the first place, that tragedy upon your life. My later teenage years, I knew the Lord. I think James is largely writing to those who know the Lord here. I knew Jesus. I was saved, but I was in rebellion. I was running. I was straying and wayward from God, trying to live in the world and the church and make those two shake hands, and they don't. All I wanted to do my senior year of high school, all I wanted to do was play in the homecoming football game. And I'll tell you why. Because I thought I would get so much glory. I thought, man, these plays are set up for me. The crowd is going to be there. My family's going to be there. And it's going to be so much about me. That's gross, but it's true. I thought, I can't wait to play because I'm running the ball all night long. And so we were running through practice a couple days before the Friday night game. One more time. Let's run it through the coach. Let's run it through one more time. Just make sure we got it. 70% effort. Nobody kill anybody. Let's just run it through. Offense, defense, and practice. 
He said, Morris, you know what you're doing? I said, I do. He said, get in position. So I got in the running back position. Coach blows the whistle. We run the play. I take the ball. I follow the blocker. I come through. He blows the whistle. Everyone's supposed to stop. We stopped. I stopped right where we were. He said, stop right there. I stopped, and the guy fell playing defense, and he fell over the other guy and fell on my knee and blew my knee out right there in practice. I was screaming on the ground, and I never played football ever again. Stood on the sidelines and crutches at the homecoming game. Some of you might not like this, but I'm going to tell you what. I knew God did that to me. He did that that night. I knew I needed to stand there and think about where I was going with my life. About all those times of conviction in church that I'd hardened my heart. All those messengers I wouldn't listen to. All those warnings that God was giving me in his grace and in his patience. And I wouldn't listen. And I needed him to pull me out of that game to turn my heart back again. I'll tell you what, I praise God that happened. I'm thankful for the storms of correction that God loved me enough. He restores us through discipline. Don't hate it. The sooner you embrace it, the sooner you get the fruit out of it, you can come to peace again. Stop fighting. You will not win. He restores us through prayer. Verse 14, he said, Is any among you sick? And he must call for the elders of the church, the shepherds, those who care and lead and guide and nurture the flock of God among them. And they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. The Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Prayer, man, so powerful. Isaac, Isaac, uh, Isaac in the Old Testament, his wife could not conceive a child. It says he prayed to the Lord for her. And they went to God and he asked God, can we have a baby? And I understand it. The Lord's answer is not always yes. There are purposes in things. And there are reasons God does and does not do things that we ask of him. But the Bible says we're allowed to come to the Lord. Let your request be made known to God. Call unto me and I will answer you, he says. Isaac prayed for Rebekah and Rebekah conceived. And they brought forth a child. The man Hezekiah was sick unto death. He was on his deathbed. A prophet of God came and he said, you're going to die. You are going to die. This is it. The Lord has spoken. There's no way out. Hezekiah wept bitterly, the Bible says, and he goes to God and he asks him for a little more life. He said, please heal me. God comes back through the prophet and he says, I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears. Behold, I will heal you and add 15 years to your life. Hezekiah gets up off the bed, made well. There are different reasons why people are sick. Sometimes that's just how it is because we live in a broken world and we just endure and it's just part of being human because God has not brought the full kingdom into the world yet where there is no sickness, where there is no death, where there is no sorrow and tears. That hasn't fully happened yet. Sometimes sickness is a correction from God to wake us up, to gain our attention. Whatever the reason, he says, is any among you sick? Then call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. A ceremonial act of faith, an acknowledgement of the power of the Holy Spirit to heal where medical knowledge leaves off, where physicians have no answers. And I don't condescend on the medical world. That's not what I'm here to do. Thankful for them. I'm thankful for their understanding and the blessing they are to our lives. But there are times when there are things only God can do. And we appeal to him for a miraculous blessing. We go to God and we gather those around us. It says, you go and we do this thing where we come before the Lord and we ask, God, will you heal me? No one can. No one knows, no one knows how, no one knows why, so we're coming. And we ask you for your miraculous touch in our physical body, on our soul, on our mind, on our flesh. That oil is not magic. It's just a ceremonial, visible acknowledgement of God's healing power, that we believe it. We believe God can heal. 
We believe he is real. We believe we belong to him. We are under his authority. We are under his care. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit as believers. Many places in the Bible, we see people doing ceremonial things that testify to what they already believe on the inside. And the thing itself is not magic, but it is a statement of their conviction. For example, in the Old Testament, when God's judgment was coming upon Egypt, what were they told to do when the death angel was going to come? He said, if you believe and you want grace and protection, kill a lamb at twilight, put the blood on the doorposts and the lintel of the house. And when he said, I see the blood, I will pass over that house. The blood was not magic. The blood was a statement of their faith. It was a conviction of what they believed. And the ones who did it, the judgment of God passed over that house. We see people come out of the waters of baptism all the time. Water's not magic. It comes out of the well. I'm not even quite sure what's in that water sometimes. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it's powerful. It's powerful what's happening. They, what they are saying and what we are visibly seeing is testifying of the salvation in which they have believed. They are saying, I have believed in the cleansing power of the only begotten Son of God for my sin. And I am here to publicly say it. And this visible act is showing the washing power of the Holy Spirit, redeeming my soul from death and judgment. That's strong, man. That's strong. We do things sometimes. We take the elements of communion. They come from a store. Okay. But he warns those in Corinth. He said, don't take this lightly. Don't make a mockery of the one whom you worship by which you are saved, who gave of his body and shed of his blood. He said, don't make a mockery of this. Some of you have mocked this. You've taken this lightly. And he says in Corinth, so this is the reason some of you are sick and some have even died. It wasn't because the elements were magic. It was because the Lord takes seriously those who are his and what we testify we are and what we believe in the same way, the oil. We come, he said, call for the elders of the church, anoint them with oil, and ask God to heal them. And he restores. There are times he restores. He raises them up to full health. And he restores through confession and repentance from sin. James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, he says, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. His example is Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again. And the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. Verse 19, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. If only Ananias and Sapphira would have confessed that they were stealing from God, they probably wouldn't have fallen over dead at the threshold of the door and been carried out by the young men. Peter gave Sapphira a shot. After Ananias had died, three hours later, she comes in and he said, tell me the price that you vowed to God. Was it this? And she had a moment right there. She didn't have to lie. She didn't have to cling to her sin. So many times we cling to our sin, but she didn't repent. If only she would have repented and said, no, it's not. We had vowed this and when we saw the money, it, it, we got greedy. It did something to our heart. We took it and now we told a lie. I bet she wouldn't have died that day. The Bible says in Ephesus, those who had come to Jesus realized the sin in their life that was present. And many of those who had believed kept coming, confessing and disclosing their practices. They were saying, this is my old life. This is where I was. This is what I've done. This is what I'm repenting of. This is what I'm turning from. There is a power in confession, not to be absolved of any man. No man has the power to absolve our sin except the one who died for our sin and rose from the dead. But there is a health in it. There is a peace. There is a freedom in it. There is sometimes a call to confess your sin to one another and say, man, this is what I've done and I'm repenting before God and to you. 
The Bible says in Nehemiah, the descendants of Israel, they stood and they confessed their sins before God and one another. We, we were idolaters. We have worshiped idols. We have sacrificed to evil deities. This is what we have done. Forgive us, O God. And they confessed their sins. David, when it says the hand of the Lord was upon him in his sin, said his vitality was drained from him as with the fever heat of the summer. Isn't that how it feels when we walk in unrepentant sin? I bet you somebody knows what I'm talking about. Because you're living it. That hand of God just pressing down on those who are his, slowly and surely, disciplining and correcting and patiently, but certainly pressing. David said, my vitality was drained away. His energy was gone. David said, there's no health in my bones because of my sin. These are the moments that you're exhausted, but you can't sleep because you're just tormented on the inside. But you want to get out of bed, but you can't. And you claw your way to your car. And like a zombie, you drive to work and you go to your job and you shuffle your feet and there's the dead look in your eyes because God is pressing you to repentance. The longer we hold that, the more dead we become. The more energy is gone. There's no peace. There's no joy. There's no fervor for life or the things of the Lord. Can't open your mouth to sing anymore. Can barely find it to pray, if at all. We run away from the scripture because we're convicted by it. And you just go through this thing. What did David say he did? He said, I acknowledge my sin to God. I confessed my transgressions to the Lord and my iniquity I did not hide. And he forgave the guilt of my sin. Oh, it's such a relief to say, this is why this has happened. This is what I have done against God. This is what I have done against people. And we are set free in our heart. And we are set free in our relationships sometimes. Sometimes we've got to go to one another and say, man, I sinned against you. I'm sorry. I hope you can forgive me. I don't know what they'll do. You can't control that part. But there are some people that they just want to be absolved of sin. They just want to pray to God, Lord, uh, you know, they don't really want to do anything. They don't really want to repent and turn. And the Bible says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Matthew chapter three, take a look to the left. James is not saying that there are holy men that can absolve sin. He is saying, man, if they are committing sin, there are those that you go to and say, man, this is what I'm coming before God with. This is what I need mercy for. This is why this storm has come upon my life. There are, sometimes that's one another. Sometimes it's spiritual leaders. But there were John the baptizer in Matthew chapter 3. He was baptizing those who were turning from sin and professing their need for God's grace and his mercy. Look what it says. Verse 5, then Jerusalem was going out to him in all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. They're saying, I need to be cleansed. I need to be renewed. I'm wrong. But when many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, uh, when he saw them coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. They just thought it was the cool thing to do. They didn't want to lose their power structure and their grip on society. And everyone was going out to be baptized by John the Baptist. So to maintain control, to maintain favor with the people, they come to the waters, they're, they're, they get in the line. And they're like, well, we're here to be baptized too. John the Baptist knows. And he goes, you brood of vipers. It's quite an approach. <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the wrath of God? What's he saying? You don't even know why you're coming. You're here to be part of a religious, the popular religious moment. You don't even really believe you have any sin. They believe they were the seed of Abraham and they had inerrantly enough righteousness of their own. What does he say? I'm not baptized. You don't know, even know what this means. 
He said, therefore, if you want to be baptized, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Why don't you turn from sin? Why don't you acknowledge you have any at all and then come to the waters of baptism and say so with a humble and real conviction? He said, I'm not, he, look, at John the Baptist, if there were men to absolve sin, it was, certainly would have been John the Baptist. And he's like, I'm not here to absolve any, but you need to repent of sin to God all by yourself and come and say it. The others were confessing, some were not. Some just want religious ritual. Some just want to be pop, at the popular religious party. They don't want to miss out, but they haven't repented. They haven't borne any fruit in keeping with repentance. I remember I was preaching years ago, and uh, later on, these two guys, they said, could we talk to you? And I said, sure. And they said, could we go someplace private? And now I knew it wasn't going to be a very good meeting. I'm like, Sure. And so we go and the three of us sit down and I said, why are we here? And the one guy said, I don't know. He said, he came and got me and said, let's go talk to somebody. He said, so I don't know what we're here to talk about. And I said, well, why are we here to the other gentleman? And he said, I'll tell you why we're here. He said, I work for him. He said, I was sitting in the message today and the Lord was just convicting my heart. His hand was drawing at me, was convicting my soul. And he turned to the guy and he said, listen, I've already taken care of it with God, but I need to take care of this with you. He said, the other day I was on the job site and I took something that belonged to you and I knew I was stealing it and I did it willingly. I stole it and I'm hidden it from you. And God won't let me go about it. He said, I repented to the Lord, but I need to confess to you and ask your forgiveness. And I said, sir, do you, do you forgive your brother? You've heard what he said. He said, of course I do. And it was a tearful hug and wonderful, peaceful fruit of righteousness is what it was. There are times that the Lord calls to our heart to restore that, not only restore peace in ourselves, but peace with one another. James comes along and and the discipline for our good is like the fire alarm. The building of your life is on fire. That's what the discipline, like the discipline of the Lord, the storm comes, you're like, why is this happening? That's the first question you should ask. What is going on? I will go to God. It says we call for prayer. Any among you suffering, pray. Anybody sick, call for people, come, pray. And then God begins to work in our heart. He begins to unearth things in our life. He begins to bring healing to our soul. And then we begin to see, man, after the Lord and his grace comes about our heart, there might be something else left to do that we need to go to somebody and bear the fruit in keeping with repentance and say, man, God disciplined me in this way. I went to him in prayer. He has restored a right standing between he and I. Our fellowship is no longer fractured in such a way, but now I need to come to you, brother, sister. And the Lord has asked me to say, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? Sometimes people stop right there. They think, well, if I'm good with God, there's nothing left to do. The Lord calls us sometimes to humble ourselves. He said, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. Your body, your soul, your relationships. Discipline, prayer, confession, repentance. He said, and he will be restored. He said, sometimes God will raise him up and he will restore us to full health again in every way. Would you bow for prayer this morning? Somebody here today or listening somewhere. You say, I've never had my sin forgiven by Jesus yet. I've been religious, but I'm one of those people that I've never been indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And I feel God calling to my heart right now. There might be somebody sitting here right now. You say, I've heard these things before. I've heard these religious terms, and I've been in churches, but there's something disrupted in my heart. And I know that it's because I don't truly know the Lord. I've never called upon Jesus to be saved. You can do that right now. By faith, you and God, 
All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Do it right now. Some brother or sister, you do know the Lord, but you've gone astray. Perhaps there is a storm upon your life because of it. Because whom the Lord loves, he disciplines for our good to turn our heart back again. His hand is pressing upon you. What will you do? I think about David. He prayed, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Somebody's anxious thoughts today. He said, see if there be any hurtful way in me. And he prayed, Lord, lead me in the way everlasting, the way of righteousness. I wonder if you've had the courage to say to God, search me, oh God. Know my heart. Might be something there that doesn't belong. And to make this storm stop, that our vitality, our fervor for the Lord, his word, our life return. The only way is to confess and repent to God, plea for him to heal us. Somebody today, there might be somebody the Lord's calling you to go to. You're gonna deal with it with God, but you know I have to go. I have to go to my wife, I have to go to my husband, I have to go to my parents. I have to go to some brother or sister in the body of Christ, the church. And I have to acknowledge I've sinned against you. And I'm asking you to forgive me. Praise the Lord. What will you do? God, we come before you right now and we just ask you for that still, small voice of your Holy Spirit to grip our attention for your word to convict our hearts. For your discipline and correction to have its way in us that we might be purified as your bride, the church. Give somebody strength today. Give somebody wisdom as to what to do. Give somebody opportunity confirmation that they would know that you have set up a conversation, a crossing of paths with somebody, that you might bring healing, that you might bring peace and blessing back. Somebody that's held on to something too long, somebody that's kept something hidden in secret for far too long, God. I pray like David, your hand would press down upon them that they would acknowledge, they would confess, knowing that you forgive the guilt of our sin. Praise the Lord. We thank you for Jesus having taken our sin to the cross in our place, rising from the dead and offering all who call upon his name forgiveness and mercy and eternal life. We pray in his name this morning. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand for one more song of worship as you just contemplate what the Lord might be speaking to your heart today.